together, guys. Every day I'm chasing something different. Every day the way I operate is totally different and it's not about the product for me as much as it is about the process. And what I mean about the process, the process saved my life. You see, my mother had me when she was 15 years old, right? Over on the east side of Atlanta, we came up in this neighborhood by the name of Kirkwood, drug dealer on every corner, gang members in the neighborhood, two bedroom home, 14 people, used to sleep on the floor. Got the opportunity to sleep in the bed one time out of the week. It was six of us in the bed, three at the foot, three at the head. And I came up with this dream pretty quick. I said, man, I want to go to the NFL because I had eight uncles in that house, all eight of which are still going in and out of prison. And so pretty quick, I said, man, I want to go to the NFL. And so I went to my big cousin tomorrow one night. I said, man, listen, I want to go to the NFL. And so we got to work for this thing. So the thing we're going to do every night, we're going to be patient. We're going to engage in consistent action. Every night, we're going to race light pole to light pole with no shoes. So every night, we would get out on the street, race light pole to light pole. One night, a coach came down the street. He signed me and my cousins up for organized sports, right? First time being in organized sports. We get in organized sports. The thing was, after practice, everybody would leave to go home. And I always had to sit on the bench and wait on my mother because she worked at Wendy's. And so when my mother would show up in the park, it would be about 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night. So I'm sitting there, and when my mother would pull up, she drove an old Buick Regal, hubcaps off the car, seats torn up, the car was all beat up. And she would pull up in the park 10.30 at night. I would jump off the bench. I would sprint over to my mother. I would say, Mom, if you don't mind, can you please sit back in your car and turn on your car lights? I have to do some extra drills. I have to go to the NFL. She would never have to work another day in your life. And I knew my mother was tired. And every night, my mother would sit back in that car, and those car lights would hit that field. And he had a seven-year-old kid doing back telling drills, running sprints, running laps, chasing his dream to go to the NFL. But just beyond those car lights, I could always connect with my mother's eyes. And so it made me dig a little bit deeper. It made me push myself a little bit further. It made me work a little bit harder. It created a certain level of sweat equity in what I was doing. It created a certain level of pride in what I was doing. You know why people quit? People don't have pride in what they do. You know why people stop? They're selfish, and it's just about them. But when you have a bigger purpose to why you're doing what you're doing and you want to honor the sacrifices that others have made for you, it's nothing for you to keep going when you hit adversity. If every decision and choice you make is just about you, at a certain point you're going to hit something that's a lot tougher than you and it's going to make you quit because you don't have a driving force for why you do what you do. But when I got up to the University of Tennessee, it was simple. It was simple for me to give everything I had. My freshman year, I played special teams. My sophomore season, I broke the star lineup, had a really strong sophomore season. The summer heading into my junior year, I still remember the day where I was sitting in our film room and I was watching film on the California Bears. My defensive backs coach, Larry Slade, came in the room. He said, Inky, I got some good news for you. I dropped the clicker. I said, what is it? He said, man, you're projected top 30 draft pick, son. He said, all you have to do is play the next 10 football games. You're an automatic multimillionaire. I went out of the room. I called my mother and my grandmother on the three-way. I said, after this season, there will be no more struggle. I said, we would never miss another meal. I said, we would never experience another Christmas where we have to stand on the side of the curb and just be grateful. And I hung it up. First football game, I went out, played great, got an interception, shut Cal down. Second game, we're playing against Air Force, got late in the game, fourth quarter, guy dropped back, he threw the ball to a receiver coming out of my sideline. Me and the guy, we went head on. Soon as I hit the guy, I felt as if every breath in my body left. Body went completely limp, fell to the ground, I blacked out. Never happened to me before. When my eyes opened, I'll never forget, my teammates ran over. They said, Ink, get up, let's go. I said, I can't. I said, I can't move. They said, what do you mean you can't move? You're out of lockdown corner, man, we need you, let's go. I said, I know, man, but this time I can't move. I flipped my head up to the sky, I said, God. I said, surely nothing is happening in this moment that can alter my life. They got me over to the hospital, they took me back, they ran CAT scans, they brought me back into my room, and all in a 15 second time frame, the doctor came running in from the opposite side. He said, hey, get in here, we gotta rush this guy back to emergency surgery, he's about to die. I said, what? He said, son, you have busted up the clavian artery in your chest, you're bleeding internally, we have to rush you back, take the main vein out of your left leg, plug it into your chest in order to save your life. When I opened my eyes from recovery, the same doctor was over me. He said, son, has some good news and some bad news for you. I said, you got some bad news for me? After telling him I was about to die, I'm still alive. How bad can it get? I'm still here. He said, the good news is we saved your life. I said, thank you, sir. He said, the bad news is, Ink, you have nerve damage in your right shoulder. I said, okay, cool. He said, but son, it's a strong possibility that you probably can never play the game of football again in your life. I said, no way. I said, no disrespect to you, Doc, but I've been working for this ever since I was seven years old. 
I said, no disrespect to you, Doc, but you wasn't in the park with me and my mother when I was seven years old and she was sitting in that Buick Regal that she got done working at Wendy's. No disrespect to you, Doc, but you didn't come up in that two-bedroom home, 14 people sleeping on the floor. No disrespect to you, Doc, but you didn't miss those meals and stay focused and never made an excuse. I never cheated. I never cheated. Like my conscience still until this day won't let me, like I can't cheat. I can't look myself in the mirror and say, Ink, you did a good job knowing that I cheated. I can't cheat. One of the greatest pieces of advice that my mother gave me was this, son, whenever you start, you make sure you finish it. And the problem with the world today, people get involved with things and if they don't like a certain person, if they don't like the process, if it's not what they thought it was, they quit. And what they don't understand about quitting, quitting become, becomes a habit that doesn't just affect you. Later on in life, when you get a wife and you get some kids or you get a family, it's going to come back to hunt you and it will one day affect them. That is why I tell you the process is more important than the product. It's not even about the outcome for me. It's about can you take pride in what you do as an individual and every night when you look in the mirror, knowing that you gave everything you had to it. And we have to get to the point where we're willing to impose our will on certain things. Impose your will on it. My life totally changed. And they gave me an opportunity to stop. And most people, when you give them an opportunity to stop while they're chasing something, they take advantage of it because they feel as if, man, why did this have to happen to me? I felt as if, why not me? This is the perfect opportunity to use this to be a blessing to somebody else. And you know what? It's not even about me to be truthful. It's not even about me. Now it's about repaying the people that invested in me and saw something in me when I couldn't see it in myself. At a certain point in life, it can't just be about you. And the moment that we understand that and every day we wake up, we understand that life is a blessing and life is a gift. And if you were to check out today, how would you want to be remembered? It's bigger than you. for my life. I just believe I deserve to give my wife the best version of me. I just believe I deserve to give my kids the best version of me. I just believe the people that I'm of service to on this earth, I deserve to give them the best version of me. And so I take a personal level of pride in everything that I do because I almost lost my life behind the game of football and God placed me on this path. And so now it's not even about me. And I'll never forget one night I came off the field and I went over to my mother. I said, can you please introduce me to my father? I need to meet him. Can you set that up? She set it up. First encounter with the guy, shook his hand. I said, hey, man, how you doing? He said, hey, little man, I heard you could play ball. I said, I heard you can too, but here's what I need you to do for me. I said, I don't need any money. I don't need any clothes. The only thing I need you to do for me is pick me up every Friday night, work me out every Saturday morning. You could take me back home after that. Can you do that? He said, yeah, I got you. First Saturday morning, he woke me up at 4.30 in the morning. He said, little man, we're running two miles to this fire station, running two miles back home. I said, cool, let's do it. Every other Saturday morning after that, wake up 4.30, run two miles there, two miles back. One Saturday, I said, man, I'm going to beat him out. I beat him out to the line. I'm standing there. My father came dragging out of the house. He was walking really slow. And so my father came out, and he walked right by me. And I looked up, and he walked right by me, and he looked up at me, and he said, son. I said, yes, sir. He said, I want you to pull that other person outside of you today. And in my mind, I'm thinking, it's, it's not another person out here. What is he talking about? It's 4.30. It's dark. He kept walking, he looked up again, he said, son, I said, yes, sir. He said, I want you to pull that other person outside of you today. Yes, sir. But in my mind at this point, I'm saying, man, he's trying to talk his way out of this thing. So the third time he said, son, I stepped back, I said, listen, pops, no disrespect. You have a job, I get it. You may be tired. I said, so you can go back in the house, you can go to sleep. There's no hard feelings, but you can't stop me from running to this fire station. I'm running whether you go or not. And he said, son, the thing I'm trying to get you to understand is this, Ink. Son, there is another person inside of you, son. The thing I'm trying to get you to understand is this, Ink. No matter how hard you work, there is somebody inside of you that works even harder. I said, son, no matter how dedicated you are, there is somebody inside of you that's more dedicated. Son, no matter how committed you are, there is somebody inside of you that's more committed. But the thing I want you to understand, there will come a point in time where you will hit a piece of adversity that's a lot tougher than you, son. And every day you get up, you will have to have a greater purpose for why you do what you do and to get up and keep going and executing whatever you do, son. That is what I'm trying to get you to understand. It's a lot bigger than running to the fire station. I'm trying to get you to push yourself to a point that you have never been to before. And so I went to Crim High School, one of the lowest performing public schools in the whole state of Georgia. Dropout rate higher than the graduation rate. People didn't go to college. I went to Crim my first day. I walked through the doors. A metal detective cop said, what's your plan, little man? I said, my plan is to go D1. He said, no, nah, you'll probably end up in cell block D1. I said, no, nah, you got the wrong guy. 
He said, no, nah, you'll probably end up in cell block D1. I said, no, nah, you got the wrong guy. After my freshman year, my mother and father both came to me and they said, Inky, we're transferring you from this place. You got a scholarship at Tucker High School. They said, all you have to do is come and play your next three years. They guarantee you a scholarship to Georgia. I said, please, leave me at one of the lowest performing public schools in the whole state of Georgia. I can get a scholarship from this place. Son, nobody goes to college from there. Please, let me stay here. I can make it from this place. They transferred me anyway. First football game, tore the ligaments in my ankle, out for the season, ended up in a wheelchair. Went back to my parents. Will you please transfer me back to one of the lowest performing public schools in the whole state of Georgia? My pastor said, Inky, you really want to go there? I said, please transfer me back there. I need to go back there. And so the summer going into my senior year, we got blessed with a new coach. He came to me. I was done with football. He said, man, please come and work out for me. Just do one workout for me. I said, okay, coach, I'll come out. I'll work out. I ran a 40-yard dash. I did some cone drills. He came up to me after the workout. He said, son, what college do you want to go to? I said, man, I just want to go D1. He said, no, you're not hearing me, son. What college do you want to go to? I said, man, I just want to go D1. He said, after the first couple of games, we'll put together a tape and we'll see what happens. After the first two games, I had nine touchdowns. It was all she wrote from there. But after that season, there were still two problems. I wasn't qualified to get into college, and I hadn't passed my Georgia high school graduation test. And so now scouts would come in, and they would say, man, you're cute, you're fast, you're quick, you're tough, you can play football, but son, we're not talking about college. We're talking about you graduating high school. And I'll never forget the day the University of Tennessee came in, and a coach took a chance on me. He sat down with me, and he said, son, I want to offer you a full scholarship to the University of Tennessee. It was so crazy, I responded, and I told him, I'm coming. And he laughed, he said, son, I don't even think you understand how the whole process works. I said, no, I don't think you understand. I said, you're talking to a kid that comes from a two bedroom home, 14 people. You're talking to a kid that every morning when I caught the bus, I would race to be the first one at the bus stop and I'll be standing there shaking my book bag and my jackets out to make sure there were no roaches and rats. So when I tell you I am coming, I am coming. You don't even have to waste the university's money. I don't have to see the campus. I don't have to see the city. You offer me a scholarship, I'm coming. He said, yeah, Ink, but I still want you to take an official visit. I agreed. I went up on a Friday night. I'll never forget, they took me to Calhoun's on the River. It's a restaurant in Knoxville, Tennessee. We come out, we got a host, right? And so the job of a host, they're supposed to show you a great time on campus, take you to parties, make you fall in love with the place. And so I come out with my host, and he said, Ink, there's a sorority party, there's a barbecue, and there's a basketball game. Which one would you like to go to? I said, man, if you don't mind, can you take me to my hotel? We pull up to the hotel. I'm getting out of the car. He said, wait, are you sick? I said, no, I'm not sick. You see what my host didn't understand? That night at the Marriott, that was my first time standing in the bed by myself. Think I cared about a sorority party? Think I cared about a barbecue or a basketball game? I went up in that room, I called my boys back in Kirkwood. I said, man, y'all ain't gonna believe this. I said, man, y'all boys gotta go to college. They said, Ink, we might can sit. I said, you get your own king size bed. But the next day when I saw that coach, I thanked him, and I still do this until this day when I see him. I said, thank you, not only for changing my life, but changing a whole generation's life that you don't even know you touch. So when I got back to Kirkwood, I went to everybody that told me I wouldn't make it. I went to that cop in that lunchroom, and I said, I told you, you had the wrong guy. So now everybody's response was, Ink, why did you fight so hard to come back to Quim High School? You had a guaranteed scholarship across town at one of the top programs. Why did you fight to come back with a dropout rate beside in the graduation rate, son? Why did you fight to come back to this place? And I said, you guys are missing a boat. I had a chance to ride an airplane once when I was in high school. It was to an all-star football game. And I'll never forget, I went in the bathroom on that airplane, and as I was washing my hands, I was going to leave, and there was a sign on the wall, and that sign said, as common courtesy to the person that's coming behind you, can you wipe the sink out and leave it better than you found it? Well, it's common courtesy to the generation that was coming to Krim High School behind me. I was about to leave that place better than I found it. And the thing that people didn't understand, the reason I had that decision and choice to make, it wasn't about Inky Johnson. Every night I slept on that floor with those roaches and rats, I had three little cousins that slept on that same floor as me. And you know what happened? When I went to college, you know what all three of them, I was the first one in my family to go to college. You know what all three of my little cousins did? Man, I don't have to sell dope. I don't have to join a gang. I don't have to end up in prison. I don't have to end up dead. All three of them got up off the same floor, went to college and graduated, and now they serve in the army. That is why I went back to Krim High School. It had nothing to do with me. If every decision and choice you make is just about you, at a certain point you're going to hit something that's a lot tougher than you, and it's going to make you quit because you don't have a driving force for why you do what you do. 
and no money doesn't have to be attached to it. It's about learning to work from the inside out in life and not from the outside in. When you work from the inside out in life, you understand your why, you understand your how, and you understand your what. I'll tell you this, in any fight, it's the guy who's willing to die who's going to win that itch. And I know if I'm going to have any life anymore, it's because I'm still willing to fight and die for that itch. Because that's what living is. There's six inches in front of your face. Now I can't make you do it. You got to look at the guy next to you. Look into his eyes. Now I think you're going to see a guy who will go that inch with you. You're going to see a guy who will sacrifice himself for this team because he knows when it comes down to it, you're going to do the same for him. That's the team, gentlemen. Break it down and hit the sideline, baby. Hard work on three, hard work on three. One, two, three, hard work. Let's get it.